to do that. Okay, so this is this is part two of diabetic eye disease, and I'll sort of do a little recap just to bring us back and focused uh, we're, we're, what we talked about last time. So the questions uh, were, diabetic retinopathy is the least common microvascular complication. Is that true or false? Or I, I'll say which answer is the correct answer out of these four. Um, it's diabetic retinopathy is the third most common cause of vision loss in working age adults. Diabetic retinopathy is not treatable once it develops. And the fourth option is associated with longer duration and higher levels of glycemia or blood sugar, as well as blood pressure and lipids. And so hopefully the presentation will answer that um, for all of us. So the eye conditions associated with diabetes, and I'll take just a moment to say people with diabetes can get eye conditions like anybody else. Um, but the eye conditions specifically associated with diabetes are first of all cataracts, which is doubled. And then the one we're gonna talk about more today, diabetic retinopathy. And this is the most common microvascular complication. Um, it's also the most frequent cause of blindness in working age adults. And 95 to 98% of this blindness could be prevented. It's preventable. The, Diabetic retinopathy is more common. The longer the person has had diabetes, the higher the blood sugars, the higher the blood pressure, and uh, the more dysregulated the lipids. It's also associated with nephropathy. It's increased by smoking and it can be exacerbated by pregnancy. There's a, a special kind of glaucoma that develops in people with diabetes. Uh, this is that neovascular glaucoma that happens from the overgrowth of blood vessels in diabetic retinopathy. People with diabetes can also get the more common open angle glaucoma. And then uh, a more common disorder associated with diabetic retinopathy is macular edema, often referred to as DME or diabetic macular edema. And that's a swelling at the, the focal point of the vision that distorts and blurs the vision. Now, uh, the typical uh, staging of diabetic neuropathy, uh, neuropathy, retinopathy, we'll walk through here. I just wanted to mention that at the recent ADA meetings and some recent papers uh, have been discussing that some of the damage in di the diabetic eye may actually start earlier with neuronal damage, like neuropathy type damage, and that there's abnormalities developing in the neurovascular unit, not just the blood vessels. And there's a, a huge project funded by the Mary Tyler Moore Foundation to get a better handle on this. So I just wanted to let you know that this uh, may be updated in the near future, and that's in process actually. Uh, trying to study this more. But typically we think of the first stage of diabetic retinopathy as non-proliferative, meaning there's not an overgrowth of blood vessels, but the high blood sugar, high blood pressure, et cetera, damage the capillaries in the retina, causing the capillaries to leak, causing the formation of these little microaneurysms and hemorrhages, and then also blocking off the capillaries. Uh, capillary occlusion. And this capillary occlusion then causes lack of oxygen, lack of blood flow getting to the ret retinal cells. So the cells have ischemia, which causes the cells to make uh, vascular endothelial growth factor and some other growth factors causing new blood vessels to grow to try to overcome this lack of oxygen. Um, and these new blood vessels are very fragile. They leak easily, they tear open easily and can result in um, uh, the hemorrhage uh, that can cause vision loss. Now macular edema can occur in either stage. It's more common in the proliferative diabetic retinopathy stage. Here it's shown on the um, non-proliferative stage 
but that's when there's not just the, the damage to the capillaries, but also all the inflammation that can happen with diabetes and it causes leakage of fluid so that it's all puffy back in there and the, the vision is uh, can be destroyed, but certainly is altered by that. Now, again, diabetes retinopathy is the most common microvascular complication in people with diabetes. And by 15 years, about 80% of people have some uh, changes to the retina. Um, people with type one diabetes uh, have ha often had it longer um, and they develop it at a younger age because they usually develop the diabetes at a younger age. But I'll say, if people with type two diabetes develop uh, diabetes at a younger age, they actually have more accelerated development of retinopathy than people with type one. So um, if you have someone who developed type two diabetes at a younger age, you really need to be on top of uh, watching their eyes. Now, how common is the vision loss from diabetic retinopathy? Remember, we just said 95 to 98% of that could be prevented. Uh, the 2018 data suggested that it was close to 12% of people have vision, vision disability or blindness from diabetes. At a recent lecture, they we, we called it out at closer to 16%. So I would say somewhere between 11 and 16% of people have um, vision loss from diabetes, most of which could be prevented. Now in people with type one diabetes, the most common cause of that vision loss is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy or those new blood vessels that bleed. Here we see a hemorrhage and it could block the whole path of vision. And it's in this gel material called the vitreous. Um, so they bleed into this gel. Um, and then as the, the blood dries up and the scar tissue and fibers of the scar tissue form, it can pull on the retina and pull it away, causing a retinal detachment. So these are the two main causes of vision loss in people with type 1 diabetes. This can also happen in people with type 2 diabetes, but more commonly uh, is the diabetic macular edema, where you see the fluid buildup uh, right in the focal point of the vision, which is going to um, make the vision blurry, distorted, or even uh, lost uh, from that. Now, uh, we talked about preventing diabetic retinopathy and the primary prevention, which would actually be secondary prevention. So primary prevention would be preventing diabetes. Secondary prevention is preventing the complications of diabetes. And of course, that would be optimizing the blood sugar, blood pressure, and lipids to slow the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy, or once someone has it, to slow the progression. Um, also, a, a key uh, factor in preventing vision loss once someone develops diabetic retinopathy is the screening annual diabetic eye exam. In the United States in 2017, for adults 40 years old or older, an average of about 62% received a dilated exam. It was more for people with a higher income and less for people with low income. Um, in Indian Health Service in 2019, pre-pandemic, about 59%, close to the 60% were um, screened and 20% were diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy. In the Portland area, 52% were screened and 16% diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy. And we heard from some of you and some of the other uh, uh, clinic attendees that sometimes they have an optometrist or an ophthalm ophthalmologist as part of the clinic team. Sometimes they have a retinal camera and a contract to have uh, those images read. And some have a mobile van that comes around and, and that provides screening services. So now we're going to move on to once diabetic retinopathy has been, has developed and been identified, what are, what are the ADA standards for how we should, how that patient should be treated? Well, in general, again, we want to control the blood sugar, the blood pressure, and 
and any form of hyperlipidemia. We want to manage the nephropathy, uh, any other diseases, uh, lung disease, et cetera, that might contribute. Uh, from the ADA standards of care, they comment that lowering the blood pressure has been shown to reduce the progression of diabetic retinopathy down to a target of about 120. They didn't see any additional benefit getting the blood pressure lower and that both ACEs and ARBs were good options for treating the blood pressure in people who have retinopathy. Uh, we also talked about when we talked about high triglycerides, how phenofibrate, um, a fibric acid medication that lowers triglycerides can help slow nephropathy. Uh, there's also some evidence that it can help slow mild retinopathy, the non-proliferative type. And so I think there's probably gonna be more work on these other contributing factors and treatments. Um, so the, the main recommendation is to promptly refer patients with any level of macular edema, severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, or any proliferative retinopathy to an ophthalmologist who is knowledgeable and experienced in the management of diabetic retinopathy. Once referred, uh, the treatment can either be the standard panretinal laser photocoagulation, or it could be an injection into that gel material, that vitreous of anti-endothelial vascular growth factor or anti-VEGF medications. And there are several on the market now, um, or it could be a combination. Now, laser versus anti-VEGF therapy, you won't be choosing uh, this for your patient. The ophthalmologist will. They'll probably consider several factors, but just as you talk to your patient or to know what to expect, with these injections, there's less loss of peripheral vision. Of course, that's one of the side effects of laser is a big reduction in peripheral vision. There's less need to have a vitrectomy where they pull uh, out that, that gel material. There's less chance of developing diabetic macular edema but it requires more visits and probably ongoing follow-up visits. And one of the concerns is there might be, there appears to be an accelerated progression if a person's in process on getting the anti-VEGF treatments and they stop, that they might actually have a rebound in, in the uh, proliferative retinopathy. Um, and in fact, one of the big concerns about treating retinopathy is the loss to follow-up. A quarter of all patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy are lost to follow-up, and it's actually a bit higher in those who are getting the laser treatment than the anti-vascular endothelial growth factor medication. The loss to follow-up was higher in those with lower income, uh, Black or Hispanic heritage and younger patients. Um, I know for my younger patients who required this, just having the vision loss was so super traumatic and heartbreaking that I didn't have many of them drop out of treatment, but I can see how this would be a huge burden going in monthly to get these injections and then maybe every three months after a year and how, how that would tend to increase dropout. Now you can also combine the uh, photocoagulation with the anti-VEGF treatment, and they actually saw a better outcome, reduce neovascularization at the disc, the optic disc, or anywhere else on the retina when the treatments were combined. So your patient might actually get both photocoagulation and uh, the the injections into the eye. The American Diabetes Association just put out a brochure, and if anybody wants it, I can get the exact name for it, but I checked and you can get it free online. And it tells you how to talk to a patient and what to explain to the patient when you're referring them. And you kind of want to tell them these, these are the options. They might do this, they might do that. 
it gives you really nice language to explain that to a patient. Um, now, remember that main referral was to promptly refer. I mean, the main standard was to promptly refer. And if you look at the definition of promptly, it means without delay. And when I was preparing this, I, I connected with a friend of mine who's a retin, retinal specialist in Denver. And he said, the biggest problem is people not getting into treatment quickly. And he, he, he sent this article, which I referenced for you. <clears throat> uh, so in the paper, it said a delay of 30 days or more that at the end of one or two years, those people have significantly worse vision than if the person can get in the day of diagnosis or relatively soon after that. So it made me wonder how rapidly you can get your patients in for treatment once uh, one of these screening modalities shows that your patient has significant diabetic retinopathy, non-proliferative or proliferative or macular edema. And some, or if your patient calls in or comes to you complaining of some of the warning symptoms that they might be on the way to vision loss, like uh, seeing a lot of spark, spots and dark strings or describing webs floating in their vision, really bad webs uh, can be a retinal detachment. Milder webs can just be a vitreous detachment, but you'd want to be sure they didn't have a retinal detachment or they often have uh, flashes of light with that. And these patients would need to be seen ASAP. We know that blurred vision and fluctuating vision can happen when the blood sugars are going up and down, but it can also be a sign of that macular edema I was telling you about, or even a sign of glaucoma. And then just having black spots uh, in, in your vision or total loss of vision can be a sign of a vitreous hemorrhage. And um, how quickly, if your patients are found on screening exam to have an abnormality or have any of these symptoms, are you able to get them into uh, the needed treatment? Now for um, diabetic macular edema, the preferred treatment right now is the anti-VEGF uh, injections. For years, laser photocoagulation was used and it did reduce any further vision loss, but with the use of these anti-VEGF injections, you can actually improve the vision. And I have a friend going through these now and they're actually having improvement in their vision. Again, it's usually a monthly injection for 12 months. And then maybe every three months they get another injection. And because of the stage of the retinopathy, they need to be followed every three months anyway. And so it can kind of line up with that needed follow-up, but it's still, um, time consuming, especially the first year. Now, if for some reason those VEGF injections, anti-VEGF injections don't work or they can't receive them, such as a pregnant patient, you wouldn't want to give an anti-vascular agent to somebody with a growing fetus. So if the patient needs, develops macular edema during pregnancy or if they've had treatment with the anti-VEGF and it doesn't work, then these people could get the photocoagulation and some uh, intra, into the eye corticosteroids. Now, really important is the fact that if a person has an indication for taking anticoagulants or aspirin, that the presence of retinopathy is not a contraindication. And I have a paper in the extra slide section showing that it actually reduces the development of retinopathy. So if you have a patient with atrial fibrillation or they've had a heart attack and they need to be on anticoagulants or they need to be on aspirin, having retinopathy is not a contraindication or worried about it causing retinopathy, it might actually prevent it. There's a lot of unanswered questions. And I think the anti-VEGF agents probably don't change the underlying ischemia. They can cause regression of the hemorrhages, the micro aneurysms, and of the new vessels that have grown. But the, the retina itself still isn't getting enough blood flow. And that's a problem. And in, in this study, it showed that 
that it did cause just the lack of blood flow to the retina by these blocked arteries. Um, remember the blocked arteries, the cells release vascular endothelial growth factor. So, and then that causes all those little blood vessels to grow. So the anti-VEGF is keeping the blood vessels, but it's not opening up the blocked blood vessels. And so they continue to have non-perfusion of the retina and loss of peripheral vision. It wasn't as bad as the loss of peripheral vision with those who had photocoagulation, but it did progressively uh, develop over uh, five years. So that's a big area that still needs an improvement in treatment, needs more research. So in summary, diabetic retinopathy has increased the longer someone has diabetes and the higher their blood sugar, blood pressure, and lipids. It's the most common microvascular complication of diabetes and is the leading cause of blindness in the United States for working age adults. But 95 to 98% of this vision loss can be, could be prevented. Prevention requires the screening to detect it and then timely treatment. Uh, with laser photocoagulation or anti-VEGF for the proliferative diabetic retinopathy or the anti-VEGF for the diabetic macular uh, changes. Uh, we need more research regarding the underlying retinal ischemia. And I think we're gonna be seeing a lot new information just to, to, just to key you in. We're gonna be seeing new information on diabetic retinopathy. Right now, we can only see a really small part of the retina. They're developing ways to see more of the retina and deeper into the retina. And they're gonna be studying some of these uh, neuronal features of retinopathy. So our post question, diabetic retinopathy, which one of these is the right answer? And of course, uh, these are all incorrect. So it's associated with longer duration and higher levels of glycemia, blood pressure, and lipids. I did wanna to talk to uh, everyone about this article that showed up in JAMA Ophthalmology that what they did is they took um, Medicare, people on Medicare, so they all had the same insurance coverage and they compared American native individuals to non-Hispanic white individuals. And they found that American native individuals had a higher claim rate for refractive errors, diabetic eye disease, blindness, low vision, injuries to the eye, and orbital and external diseases, but they had lower treatment claims, lower service claims, suggesting uh, that there were disparities despite in treatment, despite equal coverage. And if you dig into this article deeper, you find out that not only um, if, a, if a condition was diagnosed in an American native, not only was it less likely to be treated, but it was actually less likely to be diagnosed. So Native Americans have a higher rate of diabetes, but they didn't have a higher rate of diabetic retinopathy, meaning these diagnoses were being missed. And then when they were diagnosed, they, had, they were less likely to, to receive treatment despite having the same Medicare that the non-Hispanic white patients, Medicare patients had. So they, um, they said it's not genetic. This is not a genetic issue. It probably has to do with access to uh, getting tested and access for sure to getting treated. Um, so that, that made me start wondering what kind of barriers uh, some of the clinics were having in getting screening eye exams for the patients. I know COVID was a huge barrier, but pre-COVID or maybe now, what kind of barriers to access uh, to getting screened? And are there barriers to getting the patient in promptly if they have visual symptoms or have a really abnormal screening exam? So kind of what the experiences of your patients, your clinic have been in that regard. I will say that I've added, you know, the slides on the anticoagulants, this uh, whole summary of the abstract from the article I just discussed, some, some um, references that you can use for yourself 
uh, like the ADA program on diabetes eye disease, but also information to help your patients and uh, some nice, oh, this is all gonna be changed. So this is right now how they score retinopathy, but with that Mary Tyler Moore uh, Foundation project, they, they hope to totally revise this and pull in new, new data. But also some information for patients, like this is what this means, this is what this means, this is how this is done. So all of that is in your, um, in the extra slide that will go out with this recording. So, okay. So Judy or Robin, any, any barriers to you getting your patients screened or getting them in quickly for treatment if they have found, are found to have retinopathy or if they have symptoms like of a hemorrhage? Sure. Um... We have an eye doctor, an optometrist here at our clinic, um, and, and he's very good. But, you know, we live um, at least 45 minutes from the next ophthalmologist. And, um, yeah, the, the appointments are, are way, you know, booking way out. To the um, quickness of getting them in is, is really prohibitive. Um, the other thing that is not just an obvious thing, but the way eye doctor offices work is uh, a lot of uh, the traditional native people, they don't like to, get, so you go and you get into one chair and you get a little screening, then you have to go back out into a bigger, like a waiting room area, and then you go into another room and you get the the photographs of the eye, and then you mm -hmm. get sent back out and sit around for a while more. And then you go to, and you get to see the doctor, and then the doctor says something, and then you get sent back out, and then you <laughs> go to the eye place, and then you get sent back out, and then you talk to the billing. You know, so, so I've heard um, patients are like, I'm not doing that. Can, you know, can you find me a place that doesn't just, you know, push me here and push me there. And, and um, so I, I think that's prohibitive to the patients themselves. Yeah, and I would say just not even Native American. It, yeah. That is a huge yeah. problem. And then they tell you to bring something to read and you can't see anything because they've dilated your eyes. Yeah. Uh, it is really, um, it's bad for everybody. We're trying, I'm helping with a region of Colorado Medicaid and our patients aren't getting eye exams, and, or if they get them, we don't get the reports back to the primary care doctor or the endocrinologist. So we have a bad problem, I would say. Um, but we're trying to do some incentives to get retinal cameras into the primary care. They have to contract then with, with a, a retinal expert to read those. But um, I wonder if, and I think some of the clinics have retinal cameras. I don't know if TAM or Eric or anybody knows if that would be better, especially given that that as a huge barrier because, um, yeah, I don't like it, but I can see how a, a Native American would really hate it. Yeah, especially if nobody explained, you know, what, what the heck is this? Yeah. Robin, you're nodding. Are, do you guys have a retinal camera? Yeah, so we were part of the JVN network um, pre-COVID and we had four imagers and it was going okay, but the hard part was, is there was a discrepancy on like who was supposed to give the report to the patient when it came back. And I know they mailed them a letter, but um, I don't know, we had some conflicts. So anyways, um, we still have our JVN camera here, but it's been sitting idle because it's not hooked up to the network. Our optometry department, they have one optometrist and then one technician, and they bought their own machine called Optos. And so they're doing the Optos. Um, the technician will do the Optos. So he basically kind of like scans for patients that are in the clinic that day and, you know, tells the provider, send them down when they get done with their appointment or whatever. Um, but 
that's only averaging about 25 visits a month for the optos. And we have over 1200 patients with diabetes here. And um, so we are hooking up the JVN camera in the pharmacy, hopefully oh, this yeah. next week or so. And so when patients pick up their medications and we're gonna train the technicians how to run the cameras. And then if they're due for their eye exam, we'll go ahead and just put them into the counseling room and do their pictures real quick. So yeah. we hope to increase our screening with the med refill pickups. Oh, that's a great idea. I know the workflow that you mentioned is a huge barrier mm -hmm. to a lot of practices, getting that workflow figured out and getting the staff figured out. And especially post COVID, I don't know how the employee shortage thing is affecting all of your clinics, but it, the practices here where I am, they lost most of their staff and they're having to start from scratch and they don't have as many and they're on, they're like novice. I, I think there's a great opportunity there. It's just everybody, we need to work with them, you know, but um, getting the workflows figured out, like you said, who's going to do what and how to get the information and notify the patient. Um, both like who does it when. Yeah. <laughs> so I think having it in the pharmacy and having your counseling room is a great alternative option. Uh -huh. but, um, yeah, so we should be able to capture quite a few just right then and there because they'll be there. Um, we do have for treatment, though, that's another story. I think our closest treatment is about 50 minutes away. Either way, there's we don't have one in Yakima, which is just, you know, about oh, 15, yeah. 20 minutes. So we have to send people to the specialist. And I think the specialist comes over from Seattle and meets um, about an hour away. And then we do have specialists the other direction the hour away. So it has been a little bit hard as far as, and both of those locations are off the reservation. So there's limited transportation, things like that for people. And how long, even the, I mean, the transportation is a barrier itself, off the reservation is a barrier itself, but how hard is it to get them a timely appointment if you recognize something bad? Um, I think it's even, yeah, it is kind of hard. The patient has to show a lot of initiative to do that the way our system is currently set. So they get a referral and then they have to contact purchase referred care and then they will process the referral. And if the patient doesn't contact purchase referred care, then the referral just sits there until maybe I see them again. I'm like, why are you not seeing the ophthalmologist? And then they'll be like, yeah. oh, I haven't gotten a call. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of, we're trying to fix that process, but it's working between a tribal program and a federal program that, you know, yeah. we're trying to not step on toes, but help each other. What, Judy, can the ophthalmologist that's in part of your program treat the retinopathy or just screen for it? Oh, you're muted or something. Is she muted? again oh sorry we have an optometrist here so okay so he can't he or she can't treat yeah so what about if you guys find retinopathy or somebody comes in with flashing lights and black spots in their vision how quickly can you get them in um i i believe that um he can get them in through they can go through the ER at the local hospital and then they'll call an ophthalmologist in if okay. uh, um, an issue like that. Yeah, We've, we have patients do that. They often have a, a longer wait than if we could get them right into the ophthalmologist because they have to wait for the ophthalmologist to finish their day and then go to the ER. But that is another option. I don't think Robin has that. It's the, yeah. So that sounds like somewhere, something that needs some attention, right? Yeah. And I mean, I think one of the references I gave you was actually just focusing on the Northwest tribes and the number of refractory errors, meaning like right now, if I didn't have my glasses, I couldn't see the slides very well, but just think about the lack of identified refractory errors and lack of treated refractory errors, let alone this bad stuff that many of the patients in the North, Northwest area had. 
uh, just was shocking to me. So I don't know, it feels to me like we need to figure out <laughs> something. Uh, the, the screening, I, it sounds like you guys are working, the screening except for the backlog for your op, optometrist, you guys are working on the screening part is then what do we do when we find something or someone has acute symptoms? So, um, and I didn't give you an opportunity to ask questions about the presentation. And I, I know you won't be selecting the treatment. It's just sometimes nice if the patients know ahead of time, the less unknowns, often the less cold feet, maybe more cold feet, but yeah. <laughs> you say you're gonna get a shot in your eye. You have to say teeny tiny needle, they numb it, they numb your eye. Um, yeah. 